I'm John Harwood. I'd like to thank those of you in the room and those joining us online for spending your evening with us. And I'd like you to know that this debate is not rigged. No, no one has received questions in advance, illicitly or otherwise. Tonight's debate is part of a series of events that showcases Brookings experts' best ideas for the next president. Both Bill and Mariah of Brookings, two of our debaters tonight, along with 30 other scholars around the institution, have authored policy briefs that give concrete recommendations to the next president. I encourage all of you to check out the Election 2016 and America's Future Project online or by joining one of the breakfast events Brookings has scheduled over the next coming weeks. Tonight we'll be discussing free trade, which as most of you know has been the center of the presidential election. For years there was a bipartisan consensus in Washington, leadership of both parties, along with most mainstream economists on the left and right. They agreed that free trade was generally a net benefit for all economies involved. But that's changed. In the US and elsewhere in recent years, it's become clear, more clear, that the benefits of free trade are not shared evenly. Tensions around trade have grown, and today both candidates for President of the United States oppose the biggest trade deal on the horizon. That's the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Hillary Clinton has seen the base of her party shift significantly on trade. And Donald Trump has gone so far as to propose far-reaching protectionist policies that could provoke a trade war with China. So tonight the question is simple. Has free trade become a net positive for working Americans? To gauge the strength of tonight's arguments, we want to hear from you, the audience, before and after you hear from our debaters. If you've not already voted using your phone or computer, now is the time to do so. The pre-debate poll will be open for about three more minutes. You can vote via text or via web link, and instructions are on handouts around the room. If you have any questions, Brookings staff is in the back of the room to help you. To vote in the poll, please text the word Brookings to 22333, then text 1, 2, or 3. None of your information will be sold to third-party vendors. Actually, I don't know if that's true. <laughs> Text one if you think, yes, free trade deals have been a net positive. Text two if you think, no, trade deals have not been a net positive. Text three if you're undecided. For those joining us online, voting information is directly below the video player. We encourage everyone online and in the room to engage on Twitter with the hashtag BrookingsDebate. Tonight's debate will be very structured and fast moving. We'll hear eight minute opening statements from each of our panelists. And debaters, you'll have only eight minutes, so please don't make me cut you off, because I will get nasty. <laughs> then we'll get to the heart of the debate, where I will moderate it back and forth between the panel and we'll encourage debaters to engage directly with each other, responding to individual arguments. Voting will open again as we listen to the final three minute closing statements from each of our panelists. It's important to know that in order to get your results tallied in a timely manner, the final polling will end the moment the final speaker ends his closing remarks. So you must vote during the closing remarks, and after that, we'll take a few minutes to tally the votes, and finally, we'll present the results. Now let's get on to the main event. The polls will close in one minute, so now is your last chance to vote in the pre-poll. Can I ask that the panelists please make their way to the stage? Now, arguing that free trade has been net positive will be Mariah Solis and William Reinch. Arguing the net, uh, against the net positive free trade deals will be Bill Galston and Michael Lind. You have full detailed bi uh, biographies of each of our panelists in your handout. So let's begin. We'll first hear arguments in favor from Mariah Solis, who's a senior fellow in the foreign policy program at Brookings. Mariah, podium is yours.
Trade liberalization has brought substantial net benefits to working Americans. A study by the Peterson Institute estimates that trade and investment liberalization in the 50 years of the post-war era increased the incomes of Americans by $1 trillion per year. Liberalization makes us wealthier in many different ways. By bringing down tariff barriers abroad, it has allowed our competitive sectors to expand as they serve the global market, and the well-being of millions of Americans is dependent on international trade. Today, exports of goods and services support 11.6 million jobs, and these workers have access to better paying jobs because wages in the export sector are on average 18% higher. Moreover, contrary to the mercantilist rhetoric that sees imports only as harmful to the national economy, access to lower cost components also brings substantial benefits. They can be essential to sustain our export drive. We live in a world of global supply chains where companies fragment the production process across many national boundaries, and therefore imports are increasingly integrated into our export activities. This means that the cost of protectionism has also gone up. A recent report by the Council of Foreign Relations makes this crystal clear. America's largest exporter, Boeing, is able to retain its international lead from its export base in the United States by sourcing from abroad key components. These imports then help sustain thousands of well-paying jobs in the United States. And trade liberalization also greatly benefits American consumers by reducing the cost of living through access to inexpensive daily necessities. But more importantly, free trade has a progressive bias. It adds much more to the purchasing power of Americans at the bottom of the distribution ladder, as much as 62%. This means that free trade enables us to expand the consumption of the most vulnerable sectors in our society. In the second half of the 20th century, most of the gains from freer trade came from multilateral rounds of trade liberalization, but no longer so. The WTO has been unable to deliver on the Doha round, so trade agreements have largely become the vehicle for liberalization for the past two decades, and they will continue to be so in the foreseeable future. Among our existing trade agreements, NAFTA has loomed largest in the debate on the merits of liberalization. It has been a much maligned trade agreement, but in fact it has a strong record. At the most fundamental level, trade agreements aim to increase trade among the parties, and NAFTA has delivered. Trade among these three countries has grown briskly, from $290 million billion in 1993 to $1.1 trillion in 2016. U.S. trade with Mexico increased by five times, and NAFTA was mostly responsible for this expansion in trade. 55% of the increase in trade between these three countries is directly related to the trade agreement. But it is the type of trade that NAFTA promotes that is most beneficial. By promoting an integrated production platform, trade among the three countries creates positive synergies. Mexican exports to the United States contain 40% of U.S. imports, and Canadian exports 25%. Therefore, NAFTA increases production and employment in all three countries. And contrary to the sound bite that opponents use, that we would be hearing this giant sucking sound as millions of jobs would transfer, would go to the south, during the 1990s, as NAFTA was being implemented, the United States added, not subtracted, manufacturing jobs. Ironically, some politicians are advocating to scrap all our trade agreements, to forgo the gains of the most ambitious trade deal to date, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and in the most extreme case, to start a trade war through punitive tariffs, largely influenced by our experience of trading with one country that is not a trade agreement partner, and that is China. As the research on the China trade shock has shown, Imports from China were responsible for up to one-fifth of the manufacturing jobs lost during the 2000s. And very importantly, displaced workers faced a much more difficult and prolonged transition than we had previously reckoned. But the China trade shock is not an indictment of trade agreements, quite simply because we do not have one with China. 
But more importantly, in this climate of rising protectionist voices, it is not an indictment on the value of free trade. The China, the China trade shock analysis does not provide an assessment of the gains from trade with China because it only looks at import competition. It does not factor in exports or the increases in consumers' purchasing power. But even just looking at imports, a group of economists in a paper published last year have extended the original analysis to show that access to low-cost intermediate imports from China actually increased employment in the non-manufacturing sector, retail, construction services, to generate a net positive employment effect. Are there problems with China's trading practices? Of course there are. But the most effective way to tackle them is to continue to negotiate, and I should stress, ratify trade agreements that codify global standards tackling state capitalism practices. Trade, like all forms of economic change, creates winners and losers as it promotes economic transformation. And the China trade shock has shown us that we have done little meaningful uh, to help those left behind. But scapegoating trade agreements will prevent us from correcting course in this critical area. The vast majority of job losses in manufacturing are due to technological change, 85%. And yet, we offer a special adjustment program only to workers impacted by trade agreements, which means that by design, we're denying the majority of US workers these benefits. Because we insist on blaming trade, our message to most American workers has been, you're out of luck. You have no access to these additional resources. We need to recommit to our entire workforce and overhaul our adjustment programs. The United States should be known not just as a country of labor flexibility when it's easy to hire and fire, but a country of genuine labor mobility so that workers can acquire new skills, enter new fields, and tap on the economic opportunity that comes with geographical mobility. And this calls for a host of social and labor market policies, wage insurance, retraining, expanded tax benefits for the working poor. All of these are domestic policies. International trade is a source of growth for the United States and the rest of the world. However, international trade has been slowing down dramatically, partly because of the lack of liberalizing initiatives. We need trade agreements. There will not be more economic opportunity with a shrinking pie. We're all much better off if we keep the upsides of trade agreements in promoting growth, productivity, consumer welfare, while tackling the downsides of economic change with investments in our human capital. Thank you. Thank you, Mariah. Next, we're going to hear from Bill Galston. He's going to argue against the motion. Uh, Bill's a senior fellow at, in governance studies at Brookings. Bill, I cannot imagine how you could take issue with that presentation, but I get surprised every day, so go ahead. And in fact, I will not take issue with substantial portions of it, as you will hear. Uh, before I can address the question before us, which, let me remind you, reads, have free trade deals been a net positive for working Americans, I need to make it a bit more precise. First, there's a distinction between trade and trade agreements. The balance of benefits and burdens from trade can change over time, even if its legal architecture remains constant. And I assume that our focus should be on the difference that changes in this architecture have made. Second, free trade is a question of degree, because trade between nations in the modern world is always regulated to some extent. In practice, then, the question is whether deals that make markets more open than they were prior to their adoption are on balance beneficial. Third, working Americans is a term of art. We scholars here at Brookings think we work pretty hard, but we are not debating the impact of trade deals on the likes of us. The issue is their effect on non-supervisory workers, few of whom have attained a four-year college degree. The noun in the phrase working Americans is critical as well. The majority of workers in less developed countries have benefited from entering into the arrangements that structure the global market. Although this development is of great political and moral importance, it is not the issue before us tonight. 
As the World Bank economist Branko Milanovic has shown, in recent decades, the experience of workers in advanced economies has been very different from that of their peers in the developing world. And finally, the time horizon of the question is crucial. It would be absurd to claim that free trade deals have never benefited American workers. In the three days after World War II, for example, three decades after World War II, they manifestly did so. My definition of the question before us then is this. Have the trade deals of the past quarter century been on balance positive for working Americans as I have defined them? And my answer is demonstrably not. My case relies on long established government statistical series and on new research conducted by many of our best labor economists. Let me begin with one proxy for the impact of trade deals on working Americans, namely manufacturing jobs. The North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, went into effect in 1994. Between then and the end of Bill Clinton's presidency in January of 2001, as Mariah said, the number of manufacturing jobs actually rose slightly from 16.8 to 17.1 million. Perhaps this would have increased even more without NAFTA, it's hard to say, but impartial analyses conducted by the Congressional Research Service and others suggest that NAFTA's impact was relatively minor, neither delivering the huge gains its proponents promised, nor imposing the unsustainable burdens that its detractors predicted. So Mariah and I agree on NAFTA. We are not debating NAFTA, at least I'm not. The real problem lies elsewhere, specifically in China's accession to the World Trade Organization in 2001. The World Trade Organization is a trade deal, and we're not going to gerrymander it verbally out of this conversation. To be sure, Annual imports from China had already risen during the 1990s, but starting in 2001, they shifted into overdrive. Between 2001 and 2007, they more than tripled from $100 billion to $321 billion annually. During those seven years which preceded the onset of the Great Recession, the United States lost 3.4 million manufacturing jobs, fully 20% of its base in 2000. Common sense suggests and research confirms that there is a connection between these two trends. In 2013, a team of top labor economists, David Autor, David Dorn, and Gordon Hansen, published a groundbreaking article entitled The China Syndrome. They found that rising import competition from China explained as much as 55% of the manufacturing employment decline between 2000 and 2007. They also found that this decline depressed wages in non-manufacturing sectors of the economy. Taken together, decreased employment and lower wages significantly increased costs for public programs, which had to be funded by taxpayers. Not only trade adjustment assistance, but also disability insurance and food stamps, among others. A 2014 study by Abraham Ebenstein, Ann Harrison, and Margaret McMillan extended the China syndrome analysis. These authors presented evidence that, and I quote, both imports from China and offshoring to China are associated with lower U.S. worker wages. Workers driven from manufacturing to the service sector experienced pervasive wage losses. These authors found no discernible effects on, wage, on jobs and wages prior to 2000, but large effects between 2001 and 2008, adding further support to the thesis that China's entrance into the WTO enabled an import surge, the pace and scope of which overwhelmed the capacity of U.S. labor markets to adjust. Classical trade theory assumes a near frictionless labor market in which workers can shift occupations and locations in response to changing demands for their services. But the studies I've cited indicate that in the real world, workers can't shift so easily. Consider, if you're 50 years old, have worked in a factory doing the same job for decades, own a house whose value hasn't fully recovered from the Great Recession, and have an elderly parent who depends on you for care, you'll have difficulty learning a new occupation and you may find it impossible to move. In sum, 
Policymakers dramatically underestimated the negative impact of China's entrance into the WTO, and even after its consequences had become apparent, they did little to ease the plight of working Americans who were hit the hardest. Should we be surprised that these very Americans are now in revolt against trade agreements and the political leaders who sponsored them? Granted, as Mariah pointed out, there are entries on the other side of the balance sheet. But I know of no credible study showing that these effects have come close to compensating workers in the most effective sect sectors for their wage and job losses. To say nothing of China-enabled Walmart's negative impact on long-established local businesses in smaller communities throughout the United States. In conclusion, the evidence suggests that trade deals have been good for workers in developing countries and also for elites in developed countries, but bad for workers in developed countries throughout the West, including the United States. Is this a reason to abandon the entire post-war push for more open markets? No, of course not. Classical e economics is right to suggest that when two countries trade, they both gain, in the aggregate anyway. Nevertheless, some groups experience concentrated losses. Re-energizing the international economic agenda will be neither morally nor politically possible until trade deals are crafted to minimize the losses they impose on working people and until other policies are reshaped to make workers whole. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Now we're going to hear from William Reinch. William is Distinguished Fellow at the Stimson Center and a former Undersecretary for Export Administration in the U.S. Commerce Department. Go get him. Thank you very much. Uh, this appears to be an issue that proves wrong Pat Moynihan's statement that everyone is entitled to his own opinion but not his own set of facts. When you try to discuss the impact of FTAs on the U.S. economy and on American workers, you're immediately confronted with multiple conflicting sets of data. It appears that who, what, and when you count determines the answers that you get. And I want to look at each of those elements. First, who. Census Bureau data shows that last year the U.S. ran a merchandise trade surplus with 14 of our 20 FTA partners. Deficits with Jordan, Nicaragua, and Israel are fairly small. Those with Canada, Mexico, and Korea are larger. Taken together, the latter three tip the overall goods trade balance into negative territory, $64 billion last year, out of a total goods deficit of $763 billion, or 8.4 percent of the total. Uh, that's actually, compared to everybody else, i.e. non-FTA countries, a fairly good record. Second, what? That data is about merchandise trade, goods, not services. That's important because the U.S. has become largely a services economy. Excluding them omits an important piece of the puzzle, and one where the U.S. generally runs a substantial surplus, $263.5 billion last year. That included a $27.4 billion services surplus with Canada, and a $9.6 billion uh, surplus with Mexico. In the case of Canada, that was enough to wipe out the goods deficit and put the total relationship into the surplus for the first time in some years. Third, when. The data I've cited is from 2015. If you look at other years, you can come away with a different picture. For that reason, it's useful to look at the trend over a longer period of time. For example, from 2001 to 2015, our merchandise trade deficit with all of our FTA partners as a share of our total deficit fell by more than half, uh, from more than 20 percent to slightly more than 8 percent. Percentage data can be misleading, but if you look at actual numbers, you can see the same trend. The 2015 FTA partner deficit was the smallest ever, except for the recession year of 2009, even while our total deficit with other people has continued to grow. So what does all that mean? The International Trade Commission is actually tasked uh, with answering that question. And in its 2016 report, they concluded that in 2012, the year they looked at, uh, free trade agreements increased trade with our partners by 26.3%, increased total trade by 3%, increased real GDP by $32.2 billion, increased employment by nearly 160,000, and increased real wages by 0.3%. The ITC also found gains to consumers through lower prices, greater product variety, increased receipts for intellectual property, 
and a positive effect on average on U.S. bilateral merchandise trade balances. It's a fair point that these are not all large gains, particularly in, in percentage terms, given the overall size of our economy, but they are net positives nonetheless, including increases in real wages. FTA skeptics, who have their own data, also make several other arguments that I want to address uh, briefly. First, we should be clear what workers we're talking about, which is something that Bill mentioned. Looking at the opponents, and not these two guys, but the, uh, largely the people that are engaged in the anti-TPP campaign, one might get the impression that the only real workers in America are the ones who make steel, autos, furniture, or clothing, mine coals, or move stuff around. As we'll see, uh, that's a very s relatively small picture of the U.S. economy. There have been job losses over the past 20 years, often in those and other manufacturing sectors, and trade agreements are often blamed for them. That's an argument that I believe can be sustained by anecdotes. There are factories that have shut down and moved to Mexico, for example, and that story has been amply told for a long time. Uh, but it's harder to justify by overall data. As Maria pointed out, 85% of the job losses in question were caused by productivity improvements, mostly technology. Trade is an easy scapegoat. It lets us blame foreigners for our problems rather than our own policies. We, however, can also match the other side with anecdotes. Uh, I just noticed last week, I guess it was, or the week before, the head of the American Iron and Steel Institute noted that we had a three million ton steel deficit with Canada and, NAFTA, and Mexico before NAFTA, and we now have a small surplus. In other words, steel appears to be a NAFTA winner. Dan D'Amico probably wouldn't agree with that, but he and the AIS guy can argue that one out. The reality of trade is that there are always winners and losers, but the lo losses tend to be short-term and specific, and the wins long-term and diffuse. Now that's cold comfort to someone who lost her job because her plant closed, uh, if you tell her that on a net basis more jobs were created than lost, in large part because the people who lost the old jobs are rarely the same ones who get the new jobs. That's why an effective adjustment assistance program is so important. Trade accelerates change, and it's inevitable we will have people whose skills become less important as our economy grows and changes. Helping those people acquire new skills and helping them broaden their horizons should be an integral part of our trade policy. And if we do that, we need to remember, going back to a point I made a minute ago, the composition of our workforce. 91.8 million workers are private sector services employees. That's 82% of the total, and it's likely to go, go up. Our opponent, Michael Lynn, noted in a column he wrote last year that BLS uh, listed the occupations with the greatest projected job growth between 2012 and 2022, and they included personal care aides, registered nurses, retail salespersons, uh, nursing assistants, secretaries, clerical workers, customer service representatives, and construction workers. Most of those are service workers. Nostalgia about lost factories, I'm sorry to say, is just that, nostalgia. We can berate past administrations for not doing enough about that, and at points in my career I've done that, but FDA, FTAs did not lose them, and getting rid of the FTAs, or not having any more, is not going to bring them back. Instead, an effective adjustment program will help people acquire the skills they need for the 21st century economy, not the 20th century, and which are not only STEM skills, but a mix of skills that give people uh, the preparation that they need to take on the jobs that are actually available, including the kind that I just list listed. Such a program should also focus on protecting the worker, not the existing job. Otherwise, we lock ourselves into the old economy instead of the new one. Second, you can't have a discussion about trade without talking about China, as uh, Bill just mentioned a few minutes ago, the 800,000 pound elephant in the room. Now, he's talking about uh, gerrymander gerrymandering uh, China out of this discussion. I would say he's trying to shoehorn it in. Uh, we don't have an FTA with China. The proposition is about FTAs. I think it's very hard to argue that trading China, like everybody else at the WTO, constitutes some kind of special arrangement and certainly doesn't constitute trade, uh, free trade, a free trade agreement. By that logic, we also have free trade agreements with, China, with Russia, with Saudi Arabia, and 162 other countries, which is simply not the case. And in fact, we actually treat China worse uh, than most of the others because we consider it a non-market economy for trade law enforcement purposes. Uh, I think we'll come back to China in the Q&A, so I won't say anything more about uh, that right now. Finally, let's remember that net positive means more than more jobs and more than higher wages. 
Some of the most compelling arguments for FTAs, TPP you're hearing now, but also the ones in the past, have been geopolitical. Building better relationships, maintaining or enhancing the U.S. regional position, promoting democracy and human rights, promoting stability. These are American interests, these are American values, and they provide benefits to all of us, including American workers. Thank you. Our cleanup hitter is Michael Lind. Michael's the policy director at the Economic Growth Initiative at New America, an organization that he helped co-found back in 1999. Michael, have at it. Thank you. You've already uh, heard from me in Bill Reinsch's voice, uh, so now you can hear from me directly. Uh, trade is not what it used to be. What we are calling free trade agreements, it reminds me of uh, Voltaire, the French philosophe, he said the Holy Roman Empire, the name for Central Europe of the time, was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. These free trade treaties are not free trade in the classical sense. Uh, uh, they're regulatory harmonization uh, agreements. Uh, they're not treaties in the classical sense. They're more like a, a form of domestic legislation which has been outsourced to diplomats. Uh, and this is why, if you don't understand that point, you will not understand why there is this populist rebellion in Europe, in the US, and elsewhere, of a kind there never was when we did actual classical trade treaties under the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs between 1945 and, and uh, the Uruguay Round, which in the NAFTA and the WTO. Uh, those were removing barriers, particularly tariff barriers, now, we could have continued removing these barriers to the free flow of uh, goods uh, if, beginning in the 1990s, we had uh, tackled currency manipulation, of which the worst uh, uh, practitioners are China, but also Japan. Uh, uh, the Peterson Institute recently uh, published a study, which I recommend to everyone, by C. Fred Bergston uh, and by uh, uh, Joe Gagnon, uh, saying that because of currency manipulation, uh, largely by China, we've lost one to five million jobs in the last generation. Paul Volcker has said currency manipulation can wipe out all of your other safeguards in a trade treaty. Uh, and yet no president since Bill Clinton has labeled a country as a currency manipulator. And uh, the currency manipulation is left out of all of these so-called free trade treaties. So, well, what are, what are they actually doing if they're not attacking currency manipulation, which is a simultaneous export subsidy and import tariff, what, what are they doing? The Peterson Institute, you know, one, one, a generally pro-business, pro-trade organization, uh, has calculated that the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, only 12% of the gains to all of the members from the TPP would consist of tariff reductions. 88% come from reductions in non-tariff barriers in goods, services, and investment. Uh, according to uh, Peter Petri and Michael Plummer and Fan Jai of the Peterson Institute, half of the total economic benefits for the TPP as a whole come from the ability of American capitalists and corporations of American investors to invest more in Japan, uh, which has had more regulated uh, service sector markets. Uh, so that's what, what this uh, debate is really about, and that's the source of this uh, populist uh, tension. Things which traditionally were considered domestic policy in the classic area of trade, anti-trust uh, uh, policy, environmental standards, health standards, and so on, uh, un under a series of administrations uh, in Washington, th this has been seen as the next great frontier. We're going to harmonize all of these regulations. And in, in, in the European Union, this was the goal of the single market, to harmonize these uh, regulations. Okay, well, let's say this is a goal. What, that's, what about the method of, of harmonizing these things that used to be done in domestic legislation but will now be locked into cement in this trade treaty for all of the countries? Well, who's, how is this uh, done? Is it done through... Uh, participation of national legislatures and to and fro and so on. Uh, in the United States, uh, there are, uh, for the TPP, there have been 28 trade advisory committees, the most influential 16 are industry trade advisory committees. The Washington Post calculated that 85% of the advisors come from corporations. 
they're high-ranking corporate executives. Now, that's not true with Congress. If you're a working-class American, you can have some influence with your member of Congress. Uh, you basically have zero influence on these uh, uh, TPP committees. Uh, these committees are exempt from the transparency rules of other advisory committees. They're shielded from FOIA. Uh, they uh, have, there's no requirement to balance industry groups with others. So th the concern in Europe as well as the United States is that business lobbies, which can't get particular goals of theirs through domestic legislation in the House of Commons or in Congress or whatever, if you put it in the thousand pages of a treaty and then you have to say this is an up or down vote, you know, uh, uh, you, you know are, are you going to kill, are you going to humiliate the United States in the Pacific because you oppose this one particular thing? Uh, you know, this is a very effective form of lobbying because, you know, this way you're imposing this on, on multiple countries at the same time, which you could not necessarily have gotten through uh, individual uh, legislatures. Uh, so, okay, so now it is the law of the land because at least in the United States, uh, a treaty uh, uh, provisions have the force of law, right? Well, so do you enforce them by, uh, through the constitutional uh, ordinary court system? Uh, all of these treaties the United States is passing have uh, uh, what are called ISDS, uh, investor state uh, dispute uh, uh, resolution systems, which allow a corporation to sue a government if the corporation says any subsequent policy uh, since the enactment of this treaty affects uh, uh, the, the business in, in, in one way or another. Uh, the United States to date has not lost an ISDS uh, lawsuit. Uh, that's because uh, most of them consist of American corporations suing our NAFTA neighbor, Canada. Uh, Canada is the most sued country in the world under ISDS provisions of the kind that are in all of these uh, uh, treaties. Uh, ISDS lawsuits in Canada have been directed by corporations against Canada or provinces in Canada raising the minimum wage issuing new environmental regulations, new energy policies, and so on. Uh, the same is true of uh, Mexico. And uh, uh, Canada and Mexico and uh, Australia uh, have had to deal with this. If you lose one of these ISDS lawsuits, then the taxpayers of the country uh, have to pay the corporation, even if they were uh, undertaking an, uh, a domestic regulatory or legislative change uh, for other reasons. Uh, when a Mississippi state court jury ruled against the Lowen Group, uh, which was a Canadian funeral home conglomerate, they sued under the investor state dispute resolution. The tribunal uh, said that the requirement for the uh, uh, corporation to go through the jury trial system violated the company's investor rights under NAFTA. So the question before you is not whether these new fangled trade agreements, which are largely about rewriting legislation in this country and other countries. They're not about getting rid of tariffs, or for that matter, uh, other kinds of subsidies. Uh, are these good for high school educated working class Americans? Bill has made the case that that's not the case with uh, uh, the economic sphere. And I would argue that uh, it represents a disempowerment of ordinary Americans by shifting things which ought to be done through the legislature uh, to the treaty process. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to start throwing some questions at our panelists and, and uh, get the discussion moving in that way. And Mariah, I'm going to start with you. Um, I'd like you to address Michael's point that, in fact, these uh, trade arrangements are constructed by and for corporate interests uh, in ways that don't provide adequate um, checks and balances from uh, the U.S. political system uh, and confer disproportionate benefits on the people making those deals. Thank you. Um, yeah, I disagree with that proposition. I don't think that trade agreements have violated the regulatory process and decision, democratic decision making. And the first point I would like to highlight is that trade agreements still are very much driven by market access concerns. The TPP is going to eliminate 18,000 tariffs. And these tariffs can still be very large. Consider Japan's rise 
tariff, the ad valorem equivalent is 770%. So if you don't tell me that's a high tariff to tackle, then I don't know what is. Second, we need to understand why the move towards a behind-the-border regulatory agenda is not because of a conspiracy by business interest. This actually reflects the way in which international production and trade takes place today. What is the engine of growth? Is the global supply chain. What does that mean? That the trade and investment nexus is now very, very deep, and therefore we need now to codify rules in what we call market presence. That is, rules on the internationalization of services, the protection of intellectual property, competition policy to avoid predatory behavior. This is what is driving the move towards the new trade agenda. Uh, another point, that trade agreements supposedly only reflect one interest, big business. Not true. Labor is very well represented in the advisory committee system. There is a special labor advisory committee system, and the leaders of all the major labor federations are actually in a sitting in the highest labor advisory committee. Could this committee be more representative? Yes. And I would certainly like to see more NGO groups there. But it has not been possible because many of them do not want to sign on to the confidentiality agreements that are required to protect the integrity of the negotiation. Moreover, trade negotiations proceed with well-established democratic procedures whereby Congress uh, delegates the negotiation authority through trade promotion authority, and there's oversight throughout the negotiations. At the end of the day, it will be our elected representatives who have had full access to the text. It has been vetted now for a full year. Expert reports from every corner, and it's in their hands, in our elected representatives' hands, to decide the fate of the agreement. It's Ma democratic practice. Mariah, w would to, to get to a bottom line, is it your view that the depiction of these uh, agreements as uh, agreements that empower corporations that are not transparent, that um, uh, concentrate power uh, in the hands of the most affluent uh, sectors of society, that that argument is demagoguery? Uh, <laughs> to a large extent, yes. I can see why the concern emerges. I would like to see a more representative advisory system but I don't think that the system, with a, now let's use a term that's in vogue now, is rigged so that it actually only benefits one constituency. I do think that there are groups in society with higher education levels that can navigate better the transformation that comes from accelerated economic change, but I don't think that the trade agreement formulation is rigged to just serve one interest group alone. Michael, you've been indicted for demagoguery. How do you plead? <laughs> well, demagogues were tribunes of the people, uh, so in that sense, uh, uh, demagogues were tribunes of the people, so if that's the definition of uh, demagoguery, then, then I'm a demagogue. Uh, look, these things, th th my basic point is, a lot of the things that are in these FTAs may be perfectly legitimate. Uh, the problem is, uh, could the interests that support them, which tend to be corporate and producer lobbies and industry, in some cases it may be labor, some cases environmental groups, could you pass these as standalone pieces of legislation in a democratically accountable legislature in the United States, in uh, uh, Malaysia, you know, in Japan or whatever? Or is there uh, a benefit from bundling them up uh, in this giant brick of uh, pages, which suddenly lands on the, on the doorstep of the legislature whose members are told the clock is ticking, one vote, yes or no, up or down, uh, all or nothing, uh, and it, by the way, how is it, that, it will be humiliated. The, how, how is that different from taking all the expenditures and bundling to an appropriation? It's exactly like the worst forms of domestic legislation. Uh, when uh, you, you have these omnibus bills where all kinds of things are stuck in at the dark of night. Uh, so, but my basic point is that regardless of whether you support the particular policies, you have to expect there's going to be endless popular resistance to this because as even the proponents of this shift to service uh, harmonization admit, these are things which have always been done by but nation states. Hasn't it been shown the nature of our modern politics is that unless you bundle things together into an omnibus, you can't do a damn thing? Oh, I disagree entirely. For example, I've been reading the TPP. There's a lot of good stuff in there. 
Uh, and some of the supply chain things, uh, uh, which the other team has mentioned, yeah, sure, it makes sense. You, you want to have the widgets standards compatible and so on. There are FIDO sanitary standards. You want to be the same everywhere in the world. Uh, you could do a series of smaller treaties, which would not, I, I think, uh, raise this kind of reaction. On the other hand, uh, the TPP contains all sorts of restraints on, on, on countries protecting their own telecommunications systems, which really you don't need to have bundled together with the widgets and with the healthcare inspections. What about uh, unbundling big trade agreements and saying, go ahead, vote them up or down by pieces? Well, it, it means if, if we did it his way, we wouldn't have any agreements. Uh, I mean, ag agreements are the product of a negotiation, and that means by definition there's going to be some things in it that you like and there's going to be some things there that you don't like, uh, and not the same things depending on which individual it is. Uh, if you let people take it apart, you know, you'll get, uh, they'll vote for the things they like and uh, the agreement will fall apart. We used to do it that way. But prior to 1934, uh, Congress wrote the bills and, and actually voted on, as if, if people wanted to, every single tariff in the tariff schedules. That's how we got Smoot Hawley. That's no, how I'm we got the Fort Newcomer Act, to be clear. too. Uh, you know, if you want to, if, if you believe in the trade liberalization, uh, however you want to define it, is a good thing, uh, you can't possibly get there with the procedure that you've described. I'm not saying, uh, take it back, we started about the Reciprocal Trade Adjustment Act of 1934, which shifted this from congressional committees to the executive branch. I'm talking about pre-1990s. Uh, well, so, so, for example, you can get uniform airline standards, you know, safety standards, without bundling it together with drug with pharma patent monopolies. I just don't see the connection. Well, if we were acting unilaterally, sure, we could do a statement like that. But if it, look at Europe, for example, where we're going to be, if, assuming that TTIP goes forward, we're going to be negotiating things like uh, auto safety standards, including uh, things like uh, how you have to uh, fasten your uh, seat belts to the floor, of the, to the chassis of the car, and a whole host of technical details. These have turned out to be extraordinarily contentious. They do it a different way than we do. Uh, and they don't want to agree to doing it our way, and we don't want to do it, agree to doing it their way. Ultimately, there will be a compromise, uh, ho hopefully, but guaranteed somebody's going to be unhappy. And if you want to give them the opportunity then to unravel it, uh, what's going to happen is that, you know, that if we don't take something off the table, they'll take something off the table, and pretty soon you won't have very much. I, on the, the process, let me say something, because I have lived with this process since uh, the 70s, because I worked on the Tokyo Ron, which is the first time it was employed. Uh, this wasn't just a handing over of authority from the Congress to the executive. Uh, this was a bargain. Uh, and the bargain that was struck was that the, uh, the Congress agreed to a process in which they had to have one vote at the end. Uh, the administration agreed to a process in which that, in turn, there was extensive consultation uh, and the members could go to the, you know, could go to the negotiations. There was extensive contact, extensive consultation, and as a matter of fact, the way these agreements actually play out, it is in the fact that Congress that informally writes the bill that's in question. They hand it to the president and say, "Here, send this back to us, and we'll probably pass it. Send us something else, which is your right, uh, and you take your chances." And the fact is, the presidents, for the most part, going back to the 70s, have chosen to submit virtually identically what the Congress has told them to do. It has truly, until recently, uh, and I think this is a, a commentary on the overall executive legislative relationship that has a lot to do with things you know more about than I do that have nothing to do with trade, until recently, this has really been a bipartisan, very cooperative process in which both sides engage in a lot of give and take. It's been a very healthy process till the last couple of years. Um, Donald Trump, who has push, pushed this issue in the campaign, has made two arguments that aren't the same. They're maybe even a little contradictory, but nevertheless, he makes both of them. One of them is, uh, as Michael was alluding to, the idea that um, trade deals have been constructed in the donors to politicians, corporation, corporations, corporate donors, that sort of thing. The other argument that he makes is that the reason trade deals have had negative effects on American workers is that the people who made those deals, your colleagues in the Clinton administration, maybe Bill, others, are stupid and incompetent and uh, political hacks, and that uh, what we need to do is get business executives 
with a little bit of brains and deal making ability, and then they could make much better free trade deals. Is is there any truth to that whatsoever? <clears throat> It is hard to say something that is completely false. I mean, you have to work very hard, <laughs> you know, to utter a statement about the world uh, that doesn't have one percent of truth. I'm sorry, did I not have you? There we go. That doesn't have some truth, but in fact, I dissent. Can you hear now? Yeah. Okay. It's so incompetent that they even get the <laughs> microphones to work. <laughs> Those people in Washington. Right. Um, I don't subscribe to either of those propositions. I really don't. And I think that to the, to the extent. Uh, there we go. A mic that actually works. You see, I'm not incompetent. The, this debate is rigged. Or should I say, <laughs> or should I say, I'm not a cop. Uh, uh, I think the point, the point is that the world has changed dramatically in the past quarter of a century. And assumptions about the ways economies interact uh, that were valid in the three decades after the Second World War are less valid now, let me give you an example. I think it's perfectly true that in the circumstances of 1945 to 1975, whatever concentrated losses accrued from trade arrangements were quickly dispelled. People were able to move on relatively, uh, relatively easily. Our labor markets were not perfectly frictionless but they were fluid enough to be within hailing distance of standard economic models. My thesis, backed by a lot of empirical evidence, is that in the United States over the past quarter of a century, people who have experienced the concentrated losses have found it more and more difficult to adjust either occupationally or geographically. Uh, and that the combination of these two sources of friction has left, you know, uh, has left many people and entire sectors and entire geographical areas of the country at a loss, enduring losses that feel as though they're going to last forever. And in human terms, if, an, if a community has been in decline for 20 or 25 or 30 years, that is correct for policy purposes. So, so I don't think it's stupidity, and I don't think it's corruption. I think policymakers and even theories have been slow to catch up with changes in the real world. And one of the, one of the few salutary effects of this, if I may use the term, deplorable campaign, is that certain problems have been exposed, although not illuminated. And it's now the challenge facing the entire political system to come to grip some uncomfortable realities about assumptions that were truer in theory than they've turned out to be in fact. Um, I think you're right. I think those are good points. I think, um, in a way, it's kind of a, a sad commentary on the country that this has happened. You know, we, uh, the whole history of the country is the history of the frontier, and the, uh, the, the ability of Americans to always move on. You know, you weren't doing so well where you are, go that way, farther like the, the uh, hitchhiker and the, the hippie hitchhiker with a sign that just says further. That was America, and we don't do that anymore. The, our, the population isn't mobile, and for a lot of reasons. But, and rather than get into them, I would just say that the interesting thing about that piece of this discussion is that's not really a discussion about trade policy. It's a discussion about what's going on in the country. It's a discussion about economic policy. It's a discussion about the failure of successive administrations to really deal with people f that the economy really has passed by to deal with them in some creative way. Uh, my frustration, and I think, uh, is that we're debating, you know, we end up debating whether FTAs are any good or not, when what we should be debating is how we fix this particular problem, only part of which is due to free trade agreements, most of which is due to productivity improvements and technology improvements. So to, to that point, Bill, um, uh, like me, you're old enough to remember uh, 
Billy Joel's 1982 song, Allentown. Living here in Allentown, they're closing all the factories down. That was in 1982, a dozen years before, after 18 years before the China WTO. It, aren't we talking about a, a process that's been going on for a very long time that, as Bill suggested, is only partly related to trade agreements? I agree with that, only partly related. Right. And uh, I think, actually, I view debates not as Team A, Team B football games, but as what might be called competitive search for truth. And I think there's a lot of common ground between yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for good reason. Though I was on Fox just last Sunday night, let the record show. Uh, and and I've, it is a very important part of the debate, and I agree it's not directly connected to trade deals or a particular kind of trade deal we call an FTA, but that's not the only issue on the table, I would argue. Uh, Europe spends six times as much per capita on what might be broadly you know, called trade adjustment policies as the United States does. We have brought a lot of this political problem on ourselves by enacting laws and treaties and then telling the people who experience the concentrated losses, you're on your own. And whatever else we disagree about, I hope we can agree that the time for that kind of blithe disregard of the most affected individuals and communities in our country is or certainly ought to be at an end. And that uh, those people uh, that Bill is referring to, the most concentrated losers, have gotten short shrift. Is it because the people involved in negotiating trade deals, the people here in Washington, involved in legislating around them, the people in this room who are listening to this discussion are so affluent and comfortable that they are insulated from the effects of those communities and therefore insensitive to them. No, I think we have to make a distinction. I mean, the trade negotiators are there to negotiate a trade agreement and they're very competent. They, you know, every time we negotiate a trade agreement because we already have a very open economy, our trading partners know where their barriers much more than we do. In the Trans-Pacific Partnership, we're going mostly to export our approach, our standards, our rules to a number of countries that are then are going to leg up, excuse me, their environmental and labor standards. So the agreements are well negotiated. I think the responsibility is with the other part of the decision-making system that is dealing with labor market adjustment, with uh, uh, social uh, policies, and that's what's not working. And what I'm afraid of is that we have already given these programs a bad reputation. I cannot tell you how many times when I tell people, well, we need more skill acquisition, we need more education, they tell me, oh, no, no, not again. I've heard that so many times. The problem is that we talk about it, but we don't put the money in it, as Bill was saying. You know, that the United States is at the bottom of industrialized countries in terms of spending money for what we call active labor market policies. These are policies that are about mobility, Trade adjustment assistance, the one program that's more generous, for example, to facilitate geographical mobility gives the affected worker $1,200. Can you tell me how you pick up a life and move elsewhere on $1,200? It's not just, uh, it's not done. It's not going to happen. So if we really want to have, you know, these programs that work, we need to put the money where we need to do that. Michael, uh, question and, and uh, is it that... Uh, is affluent, insulated, not in touch with what's going on in those communities, ideologically resistant? Is it? Is it? Well, I, I think there's a widespread consensus, which is bipartisan, uh, which rejects the, our own history, uh, both in earlier in industry and particularly in agriculture, uh, saying that there are future industries, sunrise industries, and it's, you know, tech and social media and banking and things like that. Then there are these sunset industries like manufacturing. Uh, and so you shift the low value added production to uh, low wage workers in other countries and it helps the low wage workers. Mm -hmm. And then we specialize on the high end value chain. Now that is not the way we became the most productive agricultural producer in the world. We did not say that as the 20th century progressed, we would simply import more and more fruits and vegetables from uh, people in, in poor countries using traditional methods and for low wages. Uh, the United States 
through the Department of Agriculture, through the uh, uh, A&M universities. We mechanized agriculture. And this is a very important point. Uh, if you are a neoclassical economist looking only at the short-term price of a good or a service, then there may be no difference whatsoever between whether it's made by a, a third world uh, a worker in a oligarchic dictatorship, you know, for a dollar a day, or whether it's made by a robot factory within your country. From the point of view of America's long-term national interest, both military as well as economic, uh, we would be much better off if these job losses came about 100% as a result of automation because you would gradually, over a prolonged period of time, shed workers as we have in our highly productive mechanized agriculture system, only 2% of American farmers. Friction in the political system. Why haven't we adjusted to be more responsive to the needs of those most adversely affected? I think it was optimistic groupthink. Uh, beginning in the 1990s, where much of the bipartisan elite believed its own propaganda about uh, the jobs of the future are going to be STEM-based, you know, high-tech, professional, college-educated jobs. The piece uh, which uh, Bill very generously quoted from me was pointing out that uh, about 70% of jobs in the United States require no college education whatsoever. Only about 30% require even a BA. The ones that require postgraduate training are, are minuscule. You know, it's like 10% maybe. About corruption or insensitivity or top 1%, it is delusion. Yes, delusion. Uh, elite delusion. I think that, and I, I, John, I'm glad you asked this question because I think it goes to the heart of the political problem we faced. And that is, I think people like the people on this stage, uh, and I'll certainly speak for myself, we did not really understand what was happening in smaller towns and rural areas throughout the United States. You must have noticed that just in the past two years, there has been an avalanche of journalism and books trying to illuminate the plight of the kinds of people that people like me rarely, if ever, meet. Right? The geographical segmentation of the, the big sort, as Bill Bishop puts it, means that Americans who used to live cheek by jowl with people very much unlike themselves, this is the point of Bob Putnam's book, Our Kids, but any number of books and articles, are now separated into different social worlds. And I will have to speak frankly, but I know I'm not speaking only for myself. You know, these books, whether it's Hillbilly Elegy or White Trash or any of the books or the great reporting pieces that have come out in major journals like George Packer's piece, uh, and many national newspapers have sent reporters to these areas for the first time in a generation, this has come as a revelation to millions of upscale Americans who didn't want this to happen to their fellow citizens but now know that through a, uh, through a combination of inadequate theory and inadequate knowledge, we have allowed this to happen without even trying to help them. And I think that is driving a lot of this discussion, unfortunately. All right, on that note, we are uh, out of time for this segment. Uh, before we hear closing remarks, I want to let you know the polls are open again. Same question applies. Free trade is positive. For working America, text one if you agree that the net positive. Text two if you disagree that free trade has been a net positive for working America. Voting will remain open through the panel. Closing remarks will end. Michael Lynn finished the final closing remarks. So, uh, each of our panelists, both from the Salini team and the uh, Enlightened team, uh, <laughs> are going to have three minute uh, closing statements, and we will start with Mariah. Thank you. Um, I don't have much to add. I think a lot has been said. Um, I just want to say that I would make the case for fixing what needs to be fixed, for making sure that we do not scapegoat trade. 
We are living in a society where there's accelerated economic change, but the major driver of that is technological change. And if we continue to just be focused on trade, if we give our back on trade, as I said before, we're going to take away a lot of the consuming purchasing power. We're going to actually lose our international leadership. This is not the way to the future. I think it's better to realize that what we need to work is domestically at home in tackling the source of income inequality, in encouraging labor mobility, in making sure that we do not have this divided America that has been so prevalent in our discussions today. Thank you. Well, let me, in conclusion, just emphasize a couple of points. Uh, first of all, in the proposition before us, we were asked, have they been? The question was backward-looking, not forward-looking. And it commits us to nothing about future agreements or agreements that are now on the table. Indeed, I believe that agreements have been net positives for working Americans in the past and could, again, be net positives if the lessons of the present are taken into account in our negotiations and in the provisions of the treaty. In particular, that's point number two. In particular, uh, I am not opposed to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Let me make that very clear. Uh, and I am not opposed to it, first of all, because you I may don't... Have, you may have won. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, because, because I am... I am in. I am simply, I am simply addressing the proposition before us, right? Have they, not could they, not will they, have they, okay? That's, that's really important. I don't know whether Michael agrees with me about the TPP. Uh, he probably doesn't, but that's irrelevant for present, for present purposes. Uh, point number three. Uh, the proposition reads trade deals, not FTAs. FTAs narrows the proposition in a way that really, if we're not talking about China as part of this discussion, then we're not talking about the problem. Finally, and in that connection, if you have iPhones, turn them over, please. And here's what you'll read in small print on the back. Designed by Apple in California, Assembled in China. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now that is that is a great business model, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but I would submit that it's nothing like the source of mass employment that the industrial sector used to be for working Americans, and we have found nothing to replace that mass manufacturing employment. Until we do, we're in big trouble. Bill, you're up, and you have the opportunity to make that shoehorn argument again. Thank you. Well, it sounds like, you know, if, if you define the proposition the way that Bill defined it, which I think is the correct way to do it, I would submit we win, because I think if you look backwards, uh, it, they have been a net positive, and I think we've, uh, we've made that case. I think he's also pointed out that that's not the whole story, or it shouldn't be the whole story, and we should be looking at other issues. Uh, I think one point where we divide, which uh, might be a, is a shoehorning issue, might be a technicality, is how do we treat China? I, I did not, I don't think either one of us construed China to be part of the proposition because I don't think belonging to the WTO constitutes a deal. Belonging to the WTO is a little bit like belonging to the United Nations. There's 164 members of the WTO treating the China, Chinese like Afghanistan uh, is not exactly, you know, Favorable, favorable treatment in the context that I met the, uh, the proposition. On the other hand, you don't want to win on a technicality, necessarily. And I think the author study uh, demonstrates that there's a real issue there. I think the question going forward is, uh, which is going to require more research, which means the academics and the audience will be happy, uh, will be, one, what are the positives in the relationship as well as the negatives, because you need to, to, to balance. And second, is this kind of is this sort of is this sui generis because of its size, and uh, maybe India 20 years from now. But other than that, is this going to is this going to happen again? Is this a common occurrence? It is not the pattern, I would submit, that ensued with all of the other all of the free trade agreements that we've got, and it's not the pattern that will ensue with TTIP or uh, TPP. I don't think. 
if it's sui generis, then we may have to develop a specific set of policies that deal with it, rather than you know entirely change our trade policy uh, for the sake of of a single uh, circumstance, however large it is. I, I would also comment on the Apple case. Uh, I teach this, so it's, it, I'm reading the, the, the fine print is, is a good example. It's also worth noting, just to demonstrate the complexity of the global value chain world, is that, as I recall, for, one, for a, an Apple iPhone, I think $5.60 of the value is Chinese. The rest of the value is from somewhere else. Uh, a, a substantial part of it is from the United States, uh, because you're counting IP and a lot of other things. But a substantial part of it is from six or seven other countries as well. China is the assembly point. We count that uh, in our system as entirely the full value is an import of China. Uh, if we counted it in terms of value added, the outcome will be different. I think the standard estimate is that the, value, the amount of the bilateral deficit with China, if we did that across the board, would shrink by about 25 percent. Still a very large number, but, uh, and the total, of course, globally, would be the same, but others would be bigger, the Chinese would, be, would be smaller. Uh, it illustrates the complexity of trade right now, and it illustrates the complexity of, of dealing with it, and which goes back to a point that, that Michael made. Uh, it's hard, I think, under those circumstances and with that complex an, uh, an arrangement to expect, uh, to put Congress in a position where they can take these agreements apart and disassemble them piece by piece. Uh, Michael, you now have three minutes to answer this bill and the bill who may have abandoned you on TPP. <laughs> Well, th that bill, Bill Reinch is quite correct about the uh, foreign components of the uh, Apple iPhone. Most of them, apart from the, the quarter or so that comes from the United States, come from three countries with which the United States suffers chronic merchandise trade deficits, Japan, South Korea, and Germany, just as a point of fact. Uh, but look, insanity is defined as doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. We were told by Bill Clinton that NAFTA would produce a $200,000 net job gain, according to the Economic Policy Institute. We've lost over 850,000 jobs. You know uh, Bill Clinton's domestic policy advisor was? I do indeed. He's sitting right next to me. Uh, <laughs> and he's showing he can learn from experience. Yeah. Uh, In fact, I was, <laughs> I was the uh, domestic social policy advisor. So Bob Rubin, who is not in the room, is the one who ought to be answering your question. <laughs> In 2011, we, we, did, we did a trade deal with uh, uh, South Korea, uh, very, another FTA, uh, and what followed was a 50% jump in the U.S. Uh, trade deficit with South Korea in the next two years. Uh, so we are told this time uh, that it's all going to be different. And uh, my, my final uh, uh, thought is, since geopolitics has not been dealt with very much, uh, and the other team is trying to get China out of this, uh, the entire case for the TPP made by President Obama is that it will allow the United States to write the rules of world trade because we are already in a trade war with uh, China. Uh, he has made this case repeatedly that either America will write the rules of world trade or China will. Uh, on the TPP, I don't think it would do enormous damage. Uh, I'm opposed to it as uh, uh, Hillary Clinton is opposed to it because there's no currency manipulation feature in it. Uh, she is now, uh, and there and and you know these other ISDS type uh, provisions, which I think should just be uh, excised. Uh, but uh, look, here's the final thought: of all of the goals of U.S. foreign economic policy in 2016, 2017, the rest of this decade, doing FTAs with a small number of countries, particularly ones like South Korea, Japan, or I'm mean, not Japan. That that's important. You know, uh, Panama. Central America, this is kind of a sideshow. Uh, what should America's focus be on? It's not on expanding trade into these areas that were formerly legislated, in my opinion. It should be over mobilizing investment uh, to Sub-Saharan Africa, to India, uh, to other places. That's where the growing global middle class of the future is going to be. So there is an opportunity cost to focusing so much on trade as an engine of growth when we're in a demand-constrained global economy, and we need to put the development back in trade and development. Thank you. Um, before we uh, conclude entirely, I'm just going to do a quick uh, uh, moderator's prerogative lightning round. I want everybody to tell me 
the, your assessment of the likelihood that TPP will be approved before President Obama leaves office? Uh, unlikely. Highly unlikely. Yes. Very difficult, not impossible. Do you expect it to happen? I said very difficult. I wouldn't give it more than 10 or 15 percent. 10 or 15 percent. Yeah, tops. Okay. Um, all right. Well, that was a terrific discussion. The polls are now closed. You guys remain in your seats. I'm going to go off stage for a minute to not rig the votes, <laughs> but get the votes, and I will come back and announce who had the most compelling presentation. <laughs> Okay, guys. I have the results, and they have some good news and bad news for both sides. If you think free trade has been a net positive, before uh, our presentations, 69% of the respondents agreed with you that trade had been a net positive. So the delusion remains strong. <laughs> After the presentations, the delusion lost a little bit of altitude. Yes. And it was now 66% saying it's been a net positive. So I think we have the winners right here. Yay! <laughs> now the question is, are you willing to accept the results of the election? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. It was a lot of fun.